into their questions. Daniela, please uh, display the poll for us. Meanwhile, for all the attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box below and our, panel, our panelists will gladly answer them for you. To all our viewers on Facebook, you are most welcome to the conversation. We're now answering a poll, and the question is, in the next 25 years, do you think the world will be better, worse, or the same? In the next 25 years, do you think the world will be better, worse, or the same? If you're on Facebook, feel free to leave that in the chat box, in the comment section. And Daniela will make sure that we also get your inputs into the conversation. Great, thank you. Abigail Simwa, most welcome. She says the world will be a better place and I can see it. <laughs> thank you, Abigail. So we have the results of the poll to all our viewers on Facebook. In the next 25 years, do you think the world will be better, worse or the same? 78% of you think that the world will be better. 22% think the world will be worse and 11% think the world will be the same. I'm one of the 11%, though I did not vote. <laughs> so I'll head right into the conversation and start with Nerima Owako. Please tell us, what did you vote for and why did you give that answer? So Cynthia, um, there was like a note saying that the panelists couldn't vote. So mentally. Ah, yes, 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 <laughs> mentally. <laughs> Mentally, I actually voted for words and I feel like such a pessimist um, because I deal with a lot of governance and democracy. And so there's a huge shift that's happening globally. Uh, I think we're beginning to question whether democracy is working, uh, especially if you see even the different kinds of campaigns. We've just seen the coup in Mali and the president just being reinstated after five weeks and there's probably unfortunately going to be more uh, because we're talking about elections now taking a peak uh, with Tanzania this year we have Uganda as well and Kenya we're already campaigning and we're still like two years away uh, so for me, uh, that's why I feel there's going to be a lot of transitions, going to be a lot of change. And I'm also seeing like with the pandemic, a lot of governments have taken control when it comes to uh, expression, movement, um, daily activities, that's changed. So I also see maybe some governments taking advantage of that and wanting to remain in control even in the aspect of information so when you see things like president trump trying to ban tiktok uh meeting with facebook on privacy and data so so for me in that aspect and i also think that the challenges for young people will be so different because when we talk about access to a healthy environment 
Kinalis have so much work to do and even access to food security, access to health. So I'm just such a pessimist. I wish you didn't start with me. Um, but I think that uh, there are amazing people who are trying to do their best in those areas. So hopefully <laughs> they will make it to be better. <laughs> well, Nerima, I think it's also important to have that perspective just for us to know, are we doing the right thing? Are we not doing the right thing? I think that's a very important perspective. Elizabeth, I'll get right to you. And we have all heard of this. Thank are we so getting much, better? Are we Thank just you so the same? Thank you, for <laughs> those remarks. So I would say that based on how I would see the world being like in the next 25 years, depends on so many issues because I know while we have made some remarkable strides in some issues, we are still not doing anything or we are still not doing much in some other issues. For example, when it comes to addressing the climate and ecological crisis, and we are still treating these issues as if they were normal. So it means that how the world is going to look like in the next 25 years is entirely uh, dependent on what we are doing right now. And so when we are looking at how the world will be and looking at how our governments and the people in power are still not treating these issues as they things would like possibly be worse. But then on the other hand, there is like a lot that is going on from the young people that are trying to hold the future young uh, children and school children who are still striking for the climate every Friday to hold their governments accountable. And like yesterday, I would like to mention was a global day for action. And there were thousands and millions of young people around the world calling for governments to take action. And even right here in Kenya, we had young people who, uh, who teamed up to call on the government not to accept the plastic deal that you all had that would, uh, you know, make us uh, move backward when it comes to the ban that we have on the plastic bag. So for me, the world that I always envision is a world where we we'll put people and the planet above the profits. And until I begin to see this happening from our systems, until I begin to see this happening from our activities and everything that we are doing, then I will not have hope by then. But looking at the young people and a lot of people that are on the forefront to make sure that we shape this world, then that gives me hope that indeed we can make this Thanks, Elizabeth. And I think it's also an individual responsibility for us to recognize that for people, for planet, and for prosperity, we all have to take action. Sabita? Um, yeah, so it's nice to get different views. Um, mine would be, I think it would be better. Um, one, I think I'm an optimist. So I always try to look at the good side of what's going on. But I'll just speak, I guess, in relation to the work that I do in period poverty and period stigma, where I see it in 25 years. I think we'll definitely be like the closest step towards ending like period poverty and period stigma because one, it's something that countries are taking seriously. So if we can all follow in the footsteps of Scotland and start giving out free cards and samples, then you see we're already in the right direction. Um, there are a lot of uh, NGOs that are fighting in the states for them to abolish tampon tax and all the states. So you see like we're making strides towards changing it from a policy perspective and then even like NGOs in this space that are trying to make sure that menstruators are menstruating with dignity like already now in Kenya we're so many so I think in the next 25 years we'll have abolished it in Kenya and if we can all just continue uniting and collaborating to ensure that it ends in the whole world then we'll definitely be at a better space. In terms of gender equality I'm not too sure I feel like it'll be the same like, yes, we, we're very good at, especially Kenya, we're very good at putting things in law, but implementing is something else. So I just hope that um, people will be able to put their leaders like to task and say, you know, you said this, so how are we going to implement it? So if we continue questioning the government, if we continue having democracy, then we'll definitely go somewhere. Like, I agree with Nerima, and I don't know, maybe democracy is not the best option anymore. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting perspective right there. Natalia, do you want to add on to what Tabitha has said? Absolutely. I think uh, very, very good points that have been made. And I don't know, it feels like the younger you are, the more pessimist you are, the older you are, the more <laughs> positive you are. <laughs> um, but absolutely. I think having worked for the last 20 years, it gives me so much more knowledge in seeing where is it going. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a pretty bad cold. I'm just getting over. Um, 
I do see a huge, uh, 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 absolutely amazing opportunities coming, not just for Kenya, but for the, for the whole of Africa. Um, there are certain things that you cannot change, you cannot stop, no matter how much money, politics, or whatever else you have. And what Africa has is the youth of the world. This is something that people don't seem to understand. In Kenya alone, over the next two years alone, we will have anything between four to five million new people entering the education and the work. Um, 1.3 billion people in Africa, 65% of them are under the age of 16. 75% of 1.3 billion are under the age of 25. Because of literally the way I see it, and this might sound crazy, okay? Now they are stopping the boats going over. I think in less than 20 years, they'll be sending the boats to come over <laughs> because the rest of the world is really, really aging from that point of view. Moreover, Africa has a huge amount of resource. And what I, where I have my biggest belief is in the generations. You see, when you look at baby boomers, I am a generation Y, you look at millennials, and then you have generation X. Millennials have got a lot of bad slack because they've been trying to open, change the way they're doing things, but they are not the people that will shift the world. It is the new generation X, your Gretas, your young people who are going on to Black Lives Matters. And just like Tabitha said, it's going to be all about ethical, uh, as well as Elizabeth said, you know, it's not just about how much money you make. I, as a generation X, will choose to purchase your products by how much you affect the earth and all of those different things. So I think all of that is shifting. But moreover, I believe, especially for Kenya, there is huge opportunities ahead. Kenya speaks fluent English in terms of location is very, very well located. It is one of the most dynamic economies across all of Africa. Um, and of course, fluid, it, literally everybody speaks fluent English. To me, that is such a, a important. Before COVID, the fastest global trend growing at over a thousand percent is home working. What Corona has done is put a foot on the gas. Your location is no longer important. The jobs and the roles and the education as we know them are fundamentally changing. What that means is that the average young African can go online and learn how to website web develop. We can gain lots of skills and we can go onto the world, literally workforce market. So I do see a huge, but I will really just say one last thing. Narimo, you're absolutely right. If we don't get the governance and the corruption, I was speaking to PLO Lumumba and he said that even the young Kenyan still somehow accepts corruption, ah, it's okay. So as long as we think this and we don't bring accountability and governance, that's where the money is here already. Natalia, thank you so much for your, for your passionate thoughts. You know, I was having a conversation with someone and they told me it does not matter who, who wins or who loses, what matters is who survives. <laughs> So I'd like for the young people to think about it and just ask themselves, are you thinking of surviving, winning, or losing? Where do you lie? For our viewers on Facebook, I'd really like to know what you think. So we've talked about a few challenges right here, and I'd just like to know also from the panelists, what changes do we need to make so that we can see a better world, both here in Kenya and globally? I'll start with Tabitha. Thanks. Um, I think, yeah, that's a really good question. The first thing is that we as a youth, we need to stop being complacent with what's going on. Like we'll see corruption and today there's a scandal, NYS is on two, NYS is on three tomorrow. And we're like, you know, we make jokes about it, but we actually don't question the government. Like, what are we doing as us? Like, we just say, okay, we're corrupt. Like, if now we've accepted it as a reality, or even like when a corruption scandal comes and say, hey, they stole, but they didn't steal too much. So we need to, first of all, like, keep demanding for our rights. Like there was a reason why we were given freedom of expression. So we need to, even if it's a go do much, it's like actually demand for what we deserve and like question our leaders. And the next thing when we're voting, we need to select people who are going to take us to the next level. Like we can't be doing the same thing. And it's sad that, you know, sometimes also our generation, which you would think would be the one that would save the country is trying to repeat like what the parents um, used to do. So vote for leaders based on competency, not at the based on, 
this person is my tribe or this person said this and i feel like those are the changes that we can um start making the second the other thing is play your part if you can make a difference in any small space if you're passionate about governance even if you're going to just talk to one person about governance or give one person civil education do that like you play your part and then towards that you're like helping us get to the better world that we envision so those are the three things i would say that we can do to make the change yeah Tabitha, you've talked a lot about governance and i'd just like to follow up on that because I see in high schools, we are teaching young people to vote for their leaders, but I've also mm -hmm. done my observations, especially in some of these uh, national schools, is that for you to be elected as a captain, you need to have uh, the newest shirt, for example, very small reasons. You think it's very small, but then you realize these things actually build up when people grow up. You find that it's actually young people in schools who try to bribe their peers. These are kids bribing their own peers. How do we mm. nurture young leaders to vote responsibly before they get to the actual ballot? And I feel like, as you said, it starts there. It starts with, you know, when you're voting small he head girl for primary and it's like, oh, the person who buys the most sweets, who gives the sweets. You see, that's how corruption starts because already your, your vote has been bought. Whether you know it willingly or not, you're like, I'll vote for that person because they give me a sweet. And I think it starts with teaching leadership from such a young age, teaching people like, this is right, this is wrong. Um, I can, you see it happening in like certain schools where they have like leadership and they have leadership seminars and they teach people these things, but we now need to move it from like a, only private schools to like a national school thing because those are the people who eventually go and continue voting. So we just need to continue inculcating leadership skills and people, teaching people like their rights and what a good leader is, who a good leader looks like, you know, what you should look for, like effects, yeah, the qualities of like a leader. So that's what I think we should be able to do. So starting early is very important. And actually yeah. it is true because now I've done my observation, especially working with children and young people. And I realized these people didn't just wake up one day and realize, that, oh, let's start voting for the wrong people. They started when they were very, very young. It's something that's conditioned, mm -hmm. sorry. And just to um, finish up, it's something that con it's conditioned and it's, you, you know, you end up picking after your parents. So what your parents teach you is what you take up. So even it doesn't have to be done in school, it can start in the home. And then that's how you change like people's yeah. perspective and like how they think. Yes, for sure. Nerima, you've worked a lot with young people. What are some of the strategies that you use when it comes to responsible governance and leadership? It's just um, access to information. Because even as uh, Tabitha was talking, I was remembering how we were helping my niece with her campaign class four. And it was <laughs> so stressful. Because she would come home and be like, the other candidate is giving sweets. Even the parents, they have flyers. As well, over here with flyers with manila paper. Someone has gone and printed legit flyers and put them around the school. So it does start early and that's primary. But also another thing that we push for is access to the constitution, not necessarily the conch jargon of the constitution, but there are some basic rights that children can begin to know, even if it's in the form of games, even if it's in the form of in class material that can be fun, even the preamble. People don't even know what chapter one of our constitution says as adults. So how do you expect a child to know what we the sovereign people, how does that sentence end? Uh, people don't know it. Uh, we don't know our national values. We don't know that there are 10. We, we don't know that we have one of the only articles in the world that protects the youth specifically and that's so progressive. And, and if we were able to own that and young people to realize that, and sometimes even when we're looking at um, different kinds of constitutions, like the US, some countries don't have constitutions, like the UK as well, but then they've been so old and been utilizing these laws where people understand that I have a right as a human being to live in dignity. And for me, it's, it's that principle that sort of lacks in our youth because you also talk about responsibility so if you don't have that information how would you know what you're responsible for yet this constitution gives us so much direct power we're supposed to be able to interact with our leadership 
frequently. That's why when you see things passing, there's like, you can go to court and say there was no public participation, but the public has no clue. And so that's why I see a lot of gaps and also youth and educating them that it does take initiative. You have to be proactive, but it's also very difficult. The work that I do can be so draining. And it's also because the fact that our constitution is 10 years old, you're also working with leaders in county assembly where you're also teaching them about the constitution. So all of us are brand new, all of us. So we're also trying to figure this out. And, and you're finding that even in the county, they're like, is that my role? Isn't that the MCA? No, it's the word admin. Is it really? Which office? So you're also learning with them. And that's the challenge for me. So it would be not only do parents need to try, like even try, because we're at a level where people just, they're like, yeah, we've got a constitution. Yeah, some stuff. We see that jargon on news, like right now, two thirds, everyone is like, yeah, 261. Yes, quoting that. But then they're just like, that's it because that's what they've been shared with and so for parents to even take that proactiveness to try and even engage and even teach us so it's multi-stakeholders so it's the parents it's all of us who really need to look at all the laws that we have and be conscious of whatever it is going on around us and uh, you've also talked a lot about ownership. And I'm just curious to know, Elizabeth, if the young people in Kenya and in Africa are conscious of the issues that are going on in the environment and how can we ensure that they are actually conscious? Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that. Yes, definitely the young people are conscious about the issues that are going on. But then the question again goes back down to uh, the young people, you know, it's different. We have people from different parts of this world. We have people that are at the grassroots levels who maybe this information never gets to them. And we have people who are now possibly they can access all the information, they can access all the help they need. And for some of them, we still do not get to share their stories. So that means that if we don't share their stories, they won't even know what is going on right now. And I think this is a whole issue of having people waking up to the reality that we don't only need to have a system change, but we also need to have a change in our individual responsibility, what I like to call responsible stewardship. And I think that is one of the things that we are trying to do with the children and the young people. How are they connected? For example, you know, I relate mostly the climate and ecological crisis that is ongoing. So how do the children and the young people relate to this issue? It's a matter of before we even hold the institutions for our status and all these governments responsible, how are we as individuals doing? Are we taking our part? Are we, are we responsible enough in terms of how we want to leave this planet for the next generations? And of course, this applies to all the other issues issues of inequality, issues of the struggles with democracy. How are we as individuals trying our level best to make sure that we are making the changes even before we hold the people in power accountable? And I think this is where we put the children and the young people at the center. And when I mean at the center is having them at all the levels, making sure that they are involved in the decision making process. and. I think the best thing that we can be able to do right now is to harness the power of capacity building, harness the power of how we give this information to the young people. And I'll just like to share, for example, I know in Africa, there's always that challenge of making sure that these stories are highlighted, making sure that we even know what the young people and the children of today are up to, what are they doing to be able to make a change in the world. So, and I think that's where it all goes down. That is the only way we will know if they are even conscious enough. And I'll just like to give a practical example with some children that I really worked with. I love to work a lot with the young children and it doesn't matter the age because I know everyone can make a difference. It's not about how old you are or where you're from. Each and every person can help us make a difference in this planet. And I know at some point I took some children to a stream that was like so polluted. I personally grew up in the central highlands of Kenya and you know this is the most forested county uh, in Yuri County and at the same time this is the place you can find the clean streams. And so part of my childhood I knew that streams were supposed to be so clean. But right now if you go to our cities they look like a soup of poison. And so this day in time I took like children to this dirty stream and 
I like the question they asked me was that, I mean, who did this and what can we do about it? So it shows that the young people and the children really want to do a lot for this planet. And it's just about making sure that institutions and everyone else is working towards empowering the young people and working towards involving them and making sure that everything that they are trying to do is actually being amplified and not just being amplified, but we're also helping them make sure that they're having a maximized impact at the end of the day. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Uh, and yes, for sure, that is very true. I grew up in Kericho and I remember it was very green. And then I moved to Nairobi and the environment completely changed. So I'm so conscious of how we are destroying the environment. And sometimes I wonder, can I go back to my five-year-old self and just enjoy fresh air? But you've also talked about having institutions in place and enabling young people to participate in these kinds of changes. And I'll just get to you, Natalia, because you work in human resources and you talk a lot about the future of work. How can young people contribute to such changes, especially through the education system? Mm. First of all, I have to say, it was such a pleasure listening to, to, to uh, Nerima and Elizabeth on these topics. And I just want to say, uh, if this is who we have right now, then our future is bright. Because if our nation right now can't fix it, then your children, the ones you will be bringing up, and this goes to all of you, Cynthia, Elizabeth, Tabitha, and Narima, your children will bring that change. So that's less than 25 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a very good question you ask. When it comes to the future of work, um, I think I'm going to go back to what Elizabeth uh, really mentioned here is that a lot of the time Natalia, are you there? Natalia, we can't hear you. <laughs> you can't hear me. Oh my God, I'm yeah. sorry. I think I might. You froze. Okay, you're frozen still. Can you see me now? You're frozen, but I can hear you. Okay, can now you I hear, hear me. you. I think I'm... Yes. Okay, and can you see me as well? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I really just wanted to say that um, education, we need to give every youth more knowledge. If you throw this cup here and everybody throws this cup here, this is what will happen. It's just about giving from the youngest at the base of root, empowering them. But when it comes to the future of work, I again believe in huge amount of positivity. Your location is no longer relevant. Today, we have ghost writers in Kenya. How many degrees and PhDs and masters are they completing on behalf? We are already thinking creatively and on our feet. The future of work, Amazon has just opened 3,000 jobs in South Africa. And these are customer services roles. And your location is irrelevant because we have the youth. We are the only ones who have the youth of the world, especially over the next 10 years. And also, not just the future of work, but economies are shifting. We can see China and India taking on a complete different. India has pulled in a huge of the medical. Um, Bangladesh, in just the last two, three years, has managed to become the world's second provider of online labor. Because the world of work is substantially shifting, we have AI, we have tools, we have 3D printing, we have drones, we have self-driving cars, we have so many different things. So I believe our quality of life will improve. We will work four days a week instead of the five. <laughs> and I think, as I said, because your location is no longer here, it will never be about just what you studied. It will be about competencies and skill sets. So I see a positive future. And what are some of the competencies and skill sets? Actually, there is the only thing you need is a learning and open mind. A curious and a learning open mind is the only thing that you need. Um, you see, you as a person are a product. What you sell is your time. What you sell is your IP and knowledge. If the same knowledge that you have is available in their hundreds, then that it's like demand and supply. 
So if I, there's a high demand and there's a low supply, here's your price elasticity, more job security. So it's about predicting what is happening in the future and upskilling yourself continuously so that you have um, a more of a specialized skill. But it's what we used to hire is IQ. What we hire today is EQ, emotional intelligence, the ability to communicate, the ability to pick up things and learn, the ability to be flexible and versatile, and just be curious with an open learning mind. Mm -hmm. Those are the only things that you need. Yeah, for sure. Have an open learning mind. I can tell you for sure, I have a Bachelor of Laws degree. And when I started working, I realized not everything you study on paper is the reality on the ground. So I would even encourage young people to volunteer and develop the emotional intelligence that you're talking about, because that helps you to be very conscious of the environment and also to adapt very fast to the workplace. I'll read a few comments here. Arnold Birasa is saying, we are many optimists and will thrive. The world will be better indeed. Yes, for sure, it will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Abigail. Abigail Simwa is saying, uh, honestly, I just Googled on the national values right now. I did not know about information. Information is what young people don't have. Young people need to get information. Information is power. Just before we move to the next round of questions, that I'm very curious to know, Nerima, how you encourage young people to get information. So um, one of the ways uh, is through websites, because our constitution is also online, but that's not accessible for everybody. So a lot of times, we encourage young people to engage people in the communities who are in civil society or even leaders in the communities that they see who are active in these spaces and just request what they should read on. And even another thing is just following up on news every once in a while and being able to carry on conversations with some of your friends, you know, what do you think about this? Like even right now, what do young people think about dissolution of parliament? Um, and we can use some of our time to do that other than just engaging on maybe entertainment or what <laughs> has happened with the latest superstars and things like that. Like we could set some time aside to do that. And I think out of that, we will begin to learn. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's difficult for young people because this information is not like in your face firsthand. Because another thing that we do is request Uraya to donate to us constitutions. So we go to the counties and deliver them, but also the constitution is so conk. So you need people to translate it in a way that they're able to be conversant with it. So if youth are able to access it and try and break it down to other youth who are maybe marginalized or in the slum or don't have access to the internet, that's even better. Mm -hmm. How about information on menstrual hygiene, Tabitha? Um, so I think the first thing that we do is like, of course, we have um, online like resources which people can access on our website. But then you see that people who actually lack the access to information are the ones in underprivileged societies, so like the ones in the villages. Um, they're the ones because of their lack of information, they're being taken advantage of, or like you know, basic things that concern people don't know what that means. So for us, it's going into the communities and actually conducting the training yourself. I mean, we've faced a huge challenge um, when COVID started and there was a limitation on social gatherings because one of the best avenues that we could be able to do this is through schools. So schools have clubs, so you go and then like one Friday afternoon, you go and teach them. And then when you teach, um, I believe that when you teach like a girl about something, they're able to become a peer educator. So then they pass on the message and they go and educate other people in their community. But because that um, isn't there now, what we've been trying to do is work with community health workers who like, you know, the organizations that have come together to keep children occupied during this time. So as they play football, they also learn about menstrual hygiene. And that's an interesting way of like speaking about something that would primarily be a taboo, but also encouraging the conversation among people our age. Because you see like some things people don't know, like, you know, someone can be suffering from something like um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and they don't know what they're going through. Like them, they just know they have tough cramps 
um, are developing endometriosis, but because of the lack of information, they don't know like what's going on. But now the fact that like more and more people are talking about it, people are coming to speak about it, like Jambi Korekai, when she started talking about endometriosis, she's really shown the light on the condition and the situation. So even us as youth, we need to be open. Like if you're going through something, there's probably someone who's going through something. It's like as ladies, we all menstruate. So if it's, you can be able to help someone with an experience that you're going through. So those are the two things um, that I would say would be able to provide people access to information. And then if you also, we as youth need to actively look for information just because we don't know something, don't sit and be comfortable. Like we always need to have that hunger to know more, like that test to always like learn more. Not that just that you can conduct conversations, but so that you can also be informed and make decisions from an informed perspective. Yeah, thank you so, so much for that. To all our viewers on Facebook, make sure you keep following the conversation. Tweeters. Tag, tag me at Cynthia underscore Opera, tag Sub-Saharan Model United Nations, tag Nerima, Elizabeth, Tabitha, and Natalia online. The hashtag is hashtag UN75. And please also leave in the chat box below and tell us how you access information as a young person. Now, as we talk about solutions, I'm also curious to know what is the role of international organizations when it comes to building a better world for our young people? Elizabeth? Thank you so much. So when it comes to the role of international organizations or rather institutions, I think they definitely have a huge, huge role. And I would like to begin with what you are conversing about and that's access to information. And I know that one of the things that we try and do in terms of environment is to try and get this information to the children in their schools. But then we have a challenge because our curriculum does not really incorporate, for example, matters on climate change fully into the system. And what you find is maybe it's just a tiny subject in there. And so you don't really get to impact, you know, we don't, we don't really get to reach out as we should. Uh, for example, you see when you have subjects like home science and all these subjects that we have in our systems, and it, it means that we get to inform them better. But what if we have subjects, you know, like climate change incorporated into the entire curriculum and not just as a theoretical thing, but whereby we get to teach them and make them understand the issues that are affecting our society and make them understand what they can do about it. So I think when it comes to making some of these systems, I know there can be like, you know, international organizations would agree to make sure that something like this is incorporated in all the countries because sometimes it's really difficult to push for these things at the national level. So what if we have these bodies, international bodies, uh, incorporating such important matters into the policies? And the other thing uh, we could do definitely is to make sure that we have a shift in our economic development models into a green one. And I'm taking this COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity, for instance. I think it's about time that we shifted our economic development models into a green one. Where are we investing? Where is our money going to? What kind of projects, activities, or things are we funding as international organizations? Are we driving our energy into making sure that we empower the young people to be able to get access to information, to be able to upskill the initiatives that they're trying to run in their communities? Or are we investing in things that are going to just risk our future and make sure that we have a worse world in the next 25 years? So I think we need to have a whole shift of things. And I think this is only going to be possible if we have a whole kind of collaboration from different international organizations, because I know they all play different roles. We talk about advocacy, and I know when you talk about advocacy, it comes from different things, from funding to being on the ground, to research, to making sure that information is available. So how can all these institutions now come together and make sure that our models begin to shift because they have not yet shifted. We are still seeing dirty investments into projects and activities that are going to risk our future. So I think the international community really has a great role to play in terms of this. And the other thing definitely is amplifying the stories and the voices of the people at the grassroots and different uh, places that, don't, that we don't get to hear about because I do believe in the power of storytelling a lot. And uh, for me, Prof really inspired me, that's Professor Ngare Mathai. And as much as I really wanted to meet her as a child and plant a tree with her, which did not come to pass because she passed on when I was still in school, I embarked on reading her books, just hearing stories about her, watching documentaries and 
reading things about her and I would say this really shaped me to be, you know, this passionate and to even have that courage to step up and want to make a change, to have that courage and hunger to want to do something about different challenges in, in the society. So I think the power of storytelling should never definitely be underestimated. So how the international community can really help is make sure that we are digging deeper into these stories at the grassroots levels, these stories of people, you know, the unsung heroes that we don't really get to hear about. And definitely these people will end up inspiring other people. And at the end of the day, when we talk about the system change, uh, responsible stewardship, all these things are going to matter in the end if we let people know about what is happening and how they can be part of it or how they can also be inspired to start something different. And I think it's the same way like in the climate and environment movement, we always encourage the young people and the children to join networks, to join initiatives, to join movements. And of course, I know the international community again plays a huge role in making sure that these networks and movements that we encourage them to join are really supported and they are you know, empowered enough to be something that we can say will make an impact in the world at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So what I'm getting for you is policy and advocacy, telling stories and encouraging collaboration. And speaking of telling stories, I'd encourage all the young people on this call to check out Voices of Youth. It's run by UNICEF and it's free and accessible for you as a young person to share your stories at the grassroots level. Natalia, what is the role of international organizations when it comes to building a better world? Thank you. Um, I'm going to be very honest, as always. Um, whilst I understand that a lot of very large multinational organizations, institutions have some impact, I believe that it should be local institutions made up by local youths like Tabitha, like Elizabeth, like Narima, that will bring the standardization. I think before we look to bring anybody from outside, we have to get everything from inside. We need to have more local institutions, more locally represented because they understand the problem. When big institutions go to, for example, Asia, and they say, here's money, here's different, uh, initiatives that will have impact. The people in Asia will say, hold on a minute. No, we don't think this is the right one. We are going to do it this way. So I think before we even look at international organizations, we have to give the voice to the local individuals to push back and speak. That's my true opinion. Yes, international is good, but we need to build very strong leadership by youth in your local country, because only they will know what and the storytelling and everything else to go with that. So yes, international is good, but let us focus and create institutions in Kenya that can govern the rest of the world. For sure, for sure, for sure. So it means having institutions that young people, women, children can actually relate to and say, oh, I know Elizabeth, I see her every day when she's going to buy bread from the, from the local shop. I trust her. I guess that is what you're saying. Yeah, thank you so much. President Christopher is saying that he's so happy to see an, uh, an all-women panel. He's a young person who's passionate about youth advocacy, and he works with our Why Act AMREF, and he's also a mentor with the Imagine Leaders Foundation. So that's so amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nerima, do you think international organizations are effective when it comes to implementing change? Yeah, <laughs> you love <laughs> the hard questions. Um, <laughs> well, I think, um, in some aspects, uh, I, I do think that there are positions where they could have played a greater role, um, especially when we're speaking on the aspect of conflict and human rights violations that we see happening all over the world. Um, but what I have recognized is the struggle, especially running a youth organization and large existing institutions such as the UN, we're talking about an, an institution that has existed for 75 years and not really understanding how to adapt 
to new mechanisms of organizing. Uh, the youth now are very involved in movements, very fluid. Uh, a lot of people can't really tell you who started Black Lives Matter or Me Too movements and several others. Um, but then you can see the ripple effect that it's creating. And a lot of times we are stuck in this traditional form of organizing where if you're not a registered organization that we can say we we are connected to you, we can support you who's behind it and things like that, then it's a lot more difficult to engage you. And so I've seen that. And I feel that a lot of these international organs will have to change with the times because right now we're talking about technology being online, yet, you know, you can actually cause something like South Sudan 2013 conflict was started because of rumors on Facebook in Canada. Uh, so you can start something on Facebook <laughs> without being physically present. And so I think that these institutions have to now grapple with that in terms of how are the youth organizing? Because even when you think about Germany with their last election with Angela Merkel, uh, Rezo, uh, face, not Facebook, YouTube, 24 year old with blue hair, was talking about policies that he wanted to be inserted that needed to talk about the environment that CDU was not tackling. And he completely ambushed an entire party, the CDU, over a YouTube post. And, and so that's why I feel that they're not really there yet. And it might be difficult because they're very bureaucratic and, and youth are not completely informal sometimes, very sporadic, very quick. And so how is that system going to match this upcoming system, which like Natalia has just told us, is extremely young, vibrant and fast. And, and we're very old, slow, almost like sloths. So that's where I see a huge challenge. <laughs> I see a huge challenge coming in. And, and I also feel like it's one of those things where I do speak openly when asked about it. And I can see it's a challenge for these institutions in terms of how do we change? Because change is difficult. And, and at the same time, do we need to change so quickly because you know, we're dealing with entire democracies? So I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> have. Just... Yes, you have. You have. All right. and, and especially being a young person, yes, for sure. Yeah. You wake up today and you're like, I want to change the world. Let me do this. You don't start thinking how you'll register an organization. Majority of the organizations I have featured on, on my digital platform are actually not registered. They're young people who mm -hmm. want to change things now. Yeah. First, let's move on to the next thing. Tabitha, do you want to weigh in on what Nerima just said? First, let me just, um, I think, speak a little bit on that thing for um, being like a registered organization. Dealing with the NGO board in itself can already depress you. Like, by the time you reach the time, you bring your constitution, bring this, bring this. Like, I'll just say a short story. Um, so when I started it, because we had already started something, then we're like, oh, by the way, we need to register. Because, you know, for you to get access to grants, you need to be registered, provide your certificate of registration to open a bank account, ETC. So I was like, okay, now we have to go back in to the NGO board and register. First and foremost, it took like, I think, two years to get the certificate. The first time, gee, they've lost the documents. Let me tell you, you as a young youth, you know, in the way, not in a bad way, but I feel like as youth, our attention span is short. So... You know, they're telling you, wait, first of all, then when they lose your documents, you submit again. Then after submitting, you wait for another year. Are you going to really register your thing? And you see, and the thing is like, as yes, we might be youth organizations and we're actually the ones on the ground and we're actually the ones who can make the difference. Sometimes donors come with a mentality of, you know, like donations like from international organizations, speaking that truth, also come with a lot of strings attached. And sometimes they say, you need to do this, you need to do this. But even if this is Kenya, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. What I do in Busia wouldn't be the same thing that someone would do in Masabi. Like, the community, the culture that we have, you need to change that. So for international organizations to come and say, this one needs to be done, this one needs to be done, it's already like a hustle. So even for um, as young youth organizations, we are really struggling because we don't have the money. We want to make the change. 
the people who want to give us the money, you the process says you have to follow, apply first here, then do here, then do here. Then it takes such a long time for something that can be so simple. And you know, you can like start taking a longer time. Um, in terms of has, I think the international organizations have done something like me, the one thing that I would say stands out is how we celebrate international days. Like there's a day dedicated to doing different things that also provides education and access to information. Like on the day of the girls, are people know, okay, this was set aside for this because of this and this and this. Africa heritage is for this. So the creation of the days helps people um, know, okay, we are celebrating this. Let me go at least and read a bit about it and see what role I can play towards that. And then the fact that um, the UN gave the SDG. So we know we've been given goals, so we know this is what we need to work towards. So even us as youth organizations, if you're working in gender equality, you know, to achieve gender equality by 2030, these are the things that need to be done. So as an organization, how can I play my part? So it sort of gives you like a clear path to follow. So I'd say that's the role that is played. But in terms of, and if you're a youth organization, just keep in the fight. Like, yes, you know, because you need to do it, you have to do it, but don't give up. Don't lose hope. You know, and sometimes I even tell people, you know, start something so that you know that there's something that you started that can't fail. Like that will give you the persistence to continue like pushing when there are so many blocks and like there is like a lot of bureaucracy. Because even sometimes you will see why it will take a long time to register and enjoy it because, oh, a certain politician wants to do the same type of thing there. So it looks like you're coming to fight them. You, you're coming to make the difference. You don't care about votes. So those are the struggles that we follow. But the struggle continues. Yes, Natalia. <laughs> I want to add one thing, okay? Um, there are over 600 NGOs registered in Nairobi alone. Wow. <laughs> I think this is the capital of NGOs. <laughs> there is two types of NGOs, okay, for me. The NGOs that collect money so that they make an impact versus established NGOs. Mm -hmm. I spent 25 years in the UK, almost on every TV channel, every 15 minutes being sold a piece of Kibera, a piece of this, a piece of that. I, as an organization, will only support NGOs that are not selling the image of Africa to make money. It's almost like they are directly responsible for making the whole world think all Africa sits in one mud hut and we cough together. They are selling us and it's a business. It's not, they are not. I paid plenty of money. Plan a child, support a child, help the donkey do this, do that. And only to realize that out of every pound that I was giving, not even 10% was going to the individual. So no, um, the mentality they've created, hand me down. It's like if I, I offer a phenomenal career development program, phenomenal career development program. If I went today in Kibera, and I said, I'm going to offer this program for free to you. I would have to pay the individuals to come and attend. This is the consequence of NGOs. I'm going to leave it at that. Wow. Wow. That is... <laughs> yes, Tabitha. Just to add on that, yeah, and exactly, and it, uh, just also to touch on what um, Elizabeth said about storytelling, the story that is out there about Africa, my friends, Sometimes you're like, yes, we have our problems, but it's not like that. And you see these people tell the story, Yani, they go and look for the most impoverished situation so that they can be able to make money out of that situation. And then when they come, they've already created a donor mentality. So even us NGOs that are trying to make an impact, like we can go to a place and want to give free pads and so are like, I know. Like, why is it free? There has there to be something attached. And even the thing is, you know, and then that thing for me, like today you give me, tomorrow I come again. Like, that's the mentality that has been treated by NGOs. And sometimes, not in a bad way, they do that so they can continue their existence. Because if there's no problem, you're not, you're not raising money for anything. So I, feel, I just think we need to take charge, like, tell the African stories our way. Like, refuse people to come and take photos of like things when they go and say, you know, this is Africa, this is Kenya, this is how it looks like. That's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. The story about Africa that we tell people, and for me working in communication, I've been very conscious about it. You never take a picture of, of a child who's in a sort of disempowered situation. The photo has to empower them as a child. You don't take a photo of a malnutrition child and go sell it out in the world just to get money. No, you have to ensure that whatever story you tell empowers your own continent. And as we move on to the next question, a lot of young people 
always come to me and they ask me, so you're telling us to make a change in our community, but where do I start? Where, where do I begin? Elizabeth, where do I start as a young person and 16, 17 year old? Thank you, Cynthia. That's a great question. And I like to always respond to that question based on how I started and how I started to do what I'm doing right now. And of course, we all have anything. I presume we all have something that shaped us into doing what we are doing today. Could be our growing up, could be our education, our life, anything really that we tapped into definitely shaped us into doing what we are doing today. And for me, three things, one of them was my surrounding, just being able to grow up in a place that I could connect to my environment and nature. And the other thing was the people that really, I say, inspired me, the people I looked up to. And the third thing was the challenges that I identified with when I was a child. And I think being able to tap into the things that I would say will inspire you or the things that would influence you into doing something and then being able to make sure that there's no challenge that is holding you back is something that would make sure that you start from somewhere. And I think for me, being able to get this connection with my environment made me get to learn from nature, understand nature, and even feel the pain of nature. And that is why I would get to connect more with the environmental challenges that we are facing right now, because most of it goes back down to how the, human, the entire human race is treating our environment, is treating nature, and is treating our natural resources. And of course, then being able to learn from different people who shaped the world that we are in right now, because most of the good things that we are, we are, we are being able to benefit from in the world today, somebody fought for it. And I'll give an example with Karura Forest, Uhuru Park, all these things when we visit them, we remember Professor Angari Masai, and you know, yesterday was her memorial, so I'm, I really like to quote her a lot. And these are people who really shaped some of the things that we're enjoying today. And the other thing is, what is the challenge that you want to solve in your community? What is it that angers you? What makes you feel that I don't like to see thing, this thing in my community? I don't like to see a lot of things going on with inequality. I don't like to see corruption. I don't like to see all these things that we are talking about. And then the next step is on what do you do about it? You react, because uh, I know the human, as, in, as humans, we have the tendency of reacting to situations. We have the tendency of reacting to challenges and problems, but sometimes we just stop at the reaction. So the biggest question is how do we turn our reactions into action and do something about the things that we feel are disturbing us, the things that devastate us, the things that make us angry? because we need to develop a hunger to want to do something about these challenges. And I think that is where every young person out there ought to put all their energy in. We need to know how can we develop this hunger to want to do something. Is it by having people who inspire us? Is it by having people who mentor us? Is it by beginning to work with the little that you have? I planted my first tree when I was seven and I didn't know that many years down the line, I would now be able to have planted over 30,000. So it all begins with one step and individual responsibility, responsible stewardship. And at the end of the day, the bigger impact will come because it is those small acts multiplied by millions of people that will end up making a difference. So we don't have to wait until we have too much to do something. We can do small acts and at the end of the day, we'll make a difference. And these small acts, if we keep stepping on with courage and I mean, I think courage is everything because with courage, nothing is going to hold you back. With courage, we'll keep making the small steps and eventually they're, they're going to become bigger strides for you. So I think this is what every person out there who really wants to make a difference needs to do. Just go ahead and do it because you don't have any time to wait or we don't have any space to wait for anyone to do something about it. Just assume that no one is doing anything. So if you don't step up, then nobody else will. So I think that is the best thing I would tell to every young person out there who really wants to do something in their community and who really wants to do something about the challenges we are facing in our society today. Okay, so um, just before Cynthia gets back, I'll find her, don't worry. Let me just <laughs> I'll step in briefly. Maybe Natalia, you can add on to that, what Elizabeth has already started on. Uh, absolutely, that was absolutely phenomenal, Elizabeth. I, I could not have put it in a better way. 
the one thing I will say is that when you are young, when you are like 14, 15, 16, you think I'm still young. I still, maybe nobody will take me seriously. And you might feel like, oh, the whole problem is so big out there. Uh, it's only all little me, I, it's just me, you know. Don't ever, ever remove the power that you as an individual can have. Even what feels to you like, oh, the whole thing is, 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 there's nothing I can do. The minute you say there's nothing I can do about it, because you think, oh, it's only little old me, that's where the problem happens. I promise you, what feels like tiny little steps, just like Elizabeth said, that one tree at seven, yet now she turns back and look at the journey. Don't think that making a step is you will do it in one step. It's about a commitment and following. And please always think, don't look for the no's. Don't look for the blockers. Don't look for the problems. They're always there. Be in a way of thinking, how else can I fix this? How else can I do things? And out of my personal experience, I will say this. Every time I want to do something and I really, really want to do it, and you say, how can I fix this? It's almost like all the angels, all the universe, and God is listening, and he brings the right people at the right time. This has happened over and over and over again. All you gotta do is do not eliminate yourself because it's only little me, or I'm just a little girl, or I'm just a little, or I don't have money, or I don't have, do not remove you and you alone. If you want to do something, you have to go and find the solutions and just keep at it. Don't collect the nose. If I stopped at every time somebody said, you can't do that. No, that's not possible. Ah, oh, that's too much. Then I wouldn't be where I am in my life. Doesn't matter if you fail, just keep going. Just keep going. Don't collect the nose. Stop finding problems. Go and get the solutions. And it takes only one, only you, just you alone. Great, thank you so much. So Cynthia will join us shortly. She just had a slight issue with electricity. So thank you so much, Natalia. Naima, if you could just jump in and maybe highlight a bit more in terms of what could be the main hindrances. What's stopping you know, young people from taking up this role? Uh, you're on mute. Who is that question for? Okay, perfect. Daniela, who is, who is that question for? Oh, sorry, Nerima. Nerima. Yeah, well, I only had the end of the question, Daniela. I also like lost network a bit, could you? No problem. So I was asking, if jumping on to still the same conversation of what young people need to do, if you could highlight what could be the main hindrances um, is it something personal within young people? Is it something outside? What would you say? Oh, I, I think there are several um, hindrances. And I, I don't know if it's, uh, there's a bit of personal, but I don't want to get into that just yet. Um, I think also the way we're educated in terms of are we very inquisitive? Um, are we very, are we encouraged in terms of discovering and remolding and molding? Uh, and I think for a lot of us, our memories of primary is like the teacher that you feared the most. And for me, I hated particular subjects because of the way that teacher just walked in. And it makes me wonder if I could change that moment perhaps that would have become my favorite subject so a lot of times even the way we view education to discipline is very different and and i've written about this a few times before and and this is where i move to the environment where it's so systemic and so even when Tabitha was talking about registering, it was also very difficult for us to register. But for us, it was intentional. Um, the board was more concerned that we were trying to start a political party. And then they were actually more afraid that it was a youth political party. And so we began to question what are the systemic barriers that 
intentionally lock youth out. Because uh, even when you look at the Public Service Commission or Public Service Sector, there's a research done about two months ago that only 35% of like 800,000 employees in the public service are below the age of 55. And that's like almost 1 million people work for the government and 35% of them are below 55. And then they went further. Those who are below 35 are only 18%. So that shows you like, in these high level positions or these positions of governance, a lot of them are not young people, yet we always talk about how our population is like above 70% youthful. So you can almost see that there's, there's a bridge that's just not connecting. And, and I think we see it even in decision making tables where these decisions are made. Youth are not there. Um, and even if they're not there, there are representatives who could be there who understand the young people, but they are not there. And so you can see that there's, an in, uh, there's a gap in terms of how are we going to deal with this bulge if we don't understand the majority population that makes this bulge. And, and so those are the barriers that continue to exist. But the final thing, um, there's an article that I wrote on a on a on a quote it's an african saying i'm not sure from which country but basically we've had it before what what an old man can see seated a youth cannot see standing and so i started to like investigate like i wrote a whole <laughs> i wrote a whole essay about this and i started to investigate and i was like you know what culturally actually when it comes to community issues, when it comes to political decisions, there's the Council of Elders, um, there's these barazas, and a lot of politicians, even before they vie, they have to meet with these elders to get an endorsement. And, you know, and a lot of them are men. Let's be honest. You, I don't know why when women get older, they are never called elders, or they're never in a council. And so I'm like, okay, so they are men, and then um, they are the ones who endorse particular politicians who the community should vote for. And is it that easy for a council of elders to say, vote for this 25 year old? I see potential. He is a leader. And so those are the cultural barriers that actually still exist in our communities as to. Can a young person bring something to the table? And I think that has to change, you know, because it goes back to my previous argument where I said our issues are changing so much that even those who have led us for a long time are in a space they don't understand themselves. So it has to be all hands on deck. And and I think those are the barriers that I'm pushing. Uh, even sometimes when I write, I'm like, let's try and have intergenerational dialogues. Let's try and understand why we have particular practices and see whether we can change them. Let's see if we could have conversations with young people and come to a place of solution. And, and I think that there are some people who they get it because now when we're talking about um, the whole ministry, by the way, was closed. The ministry that deals with youth, for those who don't know, which is under CS Mushebu, which is ICT. Because most of his staff was too old to get to the office. And they were scared of getting COVID. And they didn't know how to do things online because majority do not own laptops. That is the ministry of youth. And so as soon as we realize that these barriers exist, the youth can actually step in and be at the forefront in terms of solutions. But because sometimes we're so stuck in these traditional ways of thinking and barriers, where we're still filing things in papers, and we believe in storing them in rooms that even to search for, people are too scared of storing data online because they don't know the cloud and where the cloud is exactly, and who's in charge of the cloud are things that are going to hold us back for a very long time unless we have serious conversations about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nerima. And you know, I saw a joke online that was saying, uh, 
so it's a young person talking to an older person and they were saying if you want me to help you with it stuff you have to pay me first nothing comes for free <laughs> thank you so much nerima sorry guys kplc decided to switch off the lights today and so i just uh, switched off for a second uh, thank you so much uh, to daniela for holding on to the conversation abigail is actually uh saying thank you natalia don't collect the news go find the solution and nerima you've talked a lot about youth representation and leadership but tabitha i'd like for you to touch on to tokenism because sometimes then we have young people representing other young people in leadership positions but are they really doing anything or are they just trophies somewhere <laughs> yeah i think um i believe i don't know if i said correctly but i think we do have a representation for like youth in the senate but has any youth like have youth been called and told okay now yeah, this is the person we nominate was another person hand picked so when when someone is chosen and then sometimes you know like you're chosen and you're just supposed to be there as a figurehead like you're not really supposed to talk like you know then say yes um and i feel like i think one position to represent all the youth in the country i think i feel like it's one male and one female two positions is not enough one female can't speak for the whole of they'll speak for the youth in their area probably but what you are using in your area facing is not the same thing every youth is facing so first of all they need to create more positions that youth can actually be able to sit in and serve in and it's the same way with some policies that are made like policies that relate to youth or like how the um bill for menstrual health was passed which directly relates to girl ch- girl children in in, in like high in school primary and high school Well, these girls even consulted before this thing was made. You see, it was sat by some old men and said, "You know, they need to. This is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen." So I think first we need to create more positions, and we need to shout, like actively shout and say, "You know, we need these positions and we need representations because decision making has to be user centered. You can't create something for something that you're not going to use because you don't understand the challenges that are faced. You don't understand the solution that needs to be put and how the solution needs to be brought about." So I think yeah more positions and we also need to like when you go when you do get the opportunity please use it wisely please represent us well because you know sometimes um and you would say like for example an MP like Babo we know is quite young but sometimes like there are some people in power who are not really representing us the best way that they can so if you go there and actually do your job represent us fight for our rights and then that's when we'll be able to say okay the youth are doing something and even me as a young person when i want to see something and i see someone like a little far off from my age then i get motivated and i'm like if they can do it i can also do it you know so that's what i think yes for sure it's also really good for you to look up to people like for me every time i'm writing uh you say then they ask where do you see yourself in 10 years i look for someone who's about 10 years older than me and then sort of i use that as my storyline <laughs> Uh so I've lost uh, some of the chats. Daniela if you can help me follow up on the questions because I'm conscious of time we're almost getting to 12 so I'd like to also hear the questions from some of the attendees. Uh but just sure. to move on to the last question. Natalia, does tokenism exist in the workplace? Uh when you say tokenism uh, I I'm I'm kind of uh kind of assuming that somebody's been put in a role you definitely find this a lot more in the public sector um hence why I don't work with a lot of the public sector <laughs> um uh, there were the type of people that come in uh are coming in for completely the wrong intentions um there is a, a mentality that uh if i get a job in the government i'm going to be safe for the rest of my life um and and so i think um there is a lot of tokenism that is happening let me talk about from a global point of view and that tokenism is being bringing hr on a global basis that is growing is to bring diversity Um I don't want to disclose any information but I will tell you some of the biggest multinationals that are either in America or are either in the UK up to 90 85 to 90% of their population are white men. So diversity is lacking a huge amount. So um women 
tend to be more prevalent in certain roles. Men tend to be prevalent in other roles. So sometimes, especially in the bigger institutions where there is more governance, where there is a bit more accountability or some sort of monitoring of their actions, you will find a lot of tokenism. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You will find individuals put in, in specific uh, situations more to, to, to sort of enforce the brand or kind of give reinforce the message. Um, but yeah, there are lots, I'd say, especially in females, this has been a, a big area that is growing, um, getting females to, to sit in the decision making. Um, we are 50% of the population, even more in some areas. So um, just like you were saying, Elizabeth, earlier on, you know, when we get older people sitting in a room, youth, the same thing is how creating legislation and there isn't a single woman potentially in the room. Um, for me, diversity is one of the most important. Anybody that is ever building a team, you cannot choose one gender. You cannot choose just one age. The minute you get different age, gender, background, you will get different eyes, different ways of thinking. It has been proven over and over again scientifically that a more diversified team will always perform higher. But your question is, is there a tokenism? In some roles, yes. In my world, zero. It doesn't matter what gender you are, what you are doing. If you have what my client needs, I will then position you for that role. But unfortunately, there is. And if you are in a position where you are supporting this, no, you are the problem. We have to take, I take a single, every single action that I take, I have to think, Am I really taking advantage here or not? And if we put that on ourselves, then we will get a lot more fairness. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we all have to be conscious. I'll move on to the next question, which is really the, the, the topic of the day. If you have just joined us either here on Zoom or on Facebook, we're talking about the UN 75 Dialogues. The United Nations is standing 100 years in just about 25 years. And so today we want to know how can the United Nations system improve and especially improve the lives of children and young people across the globe. Elizabeth, what can the United Nations do? Thank you, Cynthia. And I think most of these things we have definitely been highlighting, but just to, uh, you know, be more, to, to clarify more on my point on young people, I think we need to begin seeing mean, meaningful youth engagement beyond the platforms, beyond, you know, giving them, you know, beyond showing that we are really involving the young people and in the real sense, maybe there is no meaningful youth engagement. And by meaningful youth engagement, I mean tapping into the abilities of young people and not seeing as if the young people do not have the capacity because sometimes I know the trust with the young people is not usually there and that is why you find the involvement is not as we expect. And just to give an example, I know you probably have all heard about the conference of parties that happens every year. And what we, began, we saw like last year, there was a lot of involvement of the young people in the platforms, in the panels, and just you know, there was a lot of young people distribution in most of these panels, and we really do appreciate the platforms, we appreciate uh, being on the table, but what we're trying to emphasize on is being there at all the levels, because I know even before we get to these platforms, there's a lot of things that are put into making all these the decisions. There's a lot of efforts, a lot of ideas, innovations that are put into making sure that we come up with all these things that we are talking about. So how can we then uh, leverage the power of the young people? We are saying that they have the ideas, they have the solutions, they have the innovations, but are we tapping enough into all these things that we are saying? We are saying that they are the leaders, not of tomorrow, but of today. So how can we make sure that they are indeed you know, being part of the solution, that they are indeed being empowered enough. I think the best thing we can do right now is to make sure that we're having meaningful youth engagement, something that will empower the young people and not just give them the voices. I know we have right now, possibly most of the things that are happening is more of amplification of the voices of the young people. But now how can we go beyond amplifying? How can we have dialogue? How can we have all these uh, things that will now make sure that their abilities, their capacities, 
the solutions and ideas you're talking about are being implemented beyond uh, just talking about them. Because I know many of the times that the young people really present a lot of these ideas on the platforms, but what happens after? What happens after they share their ideas? What happens after they, they share all the solutions and the things that they're doing? Do we have people following up? Do we have people really making sure that they are, they're even empowering them or making sure that they're helping them have a wider impact? So I think this is a huge gap we have had in almost every other sector where we just stop at amplifying. We don't go beyond. We don't do more of the dialogue bit of it. So I think if we begin to tap into the abilities and capacities of the young people, develop that trust, and then help the young people really make a difference, because we have all heard the stories. We have heard that young people are proactive. This is an action-oriented group. And if we really want to change this planet, then the power is on them. They have the solutions. And I think what is lacking right now is how we can tap into this huge, massive power of the young people and make sure that now uh, we position it in a way that we can be able to make a huge difference in the world. So, and this goes around in empowering, capacity building, funding to these initiatives and a lot of things that can be done by different organizations. And I think the UN really in this point in time plays a critical role in making sure that this meaningful engagement for the young people is there. And I think it goes beyond even the policies because we can have them written down, but how quick and fast are we in making sure that they are implemented? So I think the best we can do is to make sure that we are really so clear on the position of the young people. We are clear on what levels are we engaging them in and how are they benefiting? How are we making sure that what they are doing is really going to benefit our world even in the next coming years? Because there is more to the young people beyond the platforms. I think that is something that we really need to amplify on as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what is meaningful youth engagement? And I think a lot of organizations, not just the United Nations, are grappling with what is meaningful youth engagement? Is it just bringing them, putting them in, in committees and, and very big uh, bodies? Or how do we actually engage with them? And Nerima, maybe you can explain for us what meaningful engagement means, especially when it comes to the role of the United Nations. I mean, it's exactly what Elizabeth had talked about in terms of involving them in different stages or involving young people in different stages, not just on, say, panel discussions. And another thing that even irritates me is that um, a lot of times if we're having new specific topics, you'll find it's even in the afternoon uh, when everybody important has left. Or, um, I mean, it's one way, but, but to be meaningful, you have to have an aspect of information and education. There's no way you can start engaging young people without that basis. And that's coming from my experience with our work uh, with governance. So a lot of people make the assumption that, oh, they already know what needs to be done. Let's just teach them how to do it better. So you have to start from scratch in terms of People don't know their rights, people don't know their constitution, let's teach that. And then the avenues that they can participate, let's teach that. And then methods of participation, let's teach that. And then even when we come to what are the issues the youth are facing in a particular community or area, now we, we involve in building a campaign around that issue. So as much as they're the ones who come and say, you know, our issue is access to water. We're like, okay, this is the CEC for water. We need to write him a letter. And they would say, well, how do you write a formal letter? And you'd be surprised. It's some of the smallest of things uh, because even a lot of youth do not know that government actually has to respond. Uh, when you write them a formal letter, they have to say they received it and they have to give you a response within a time period. People don't know that. <laughs> and so we capitalize on that. And, and they begin to see that it's actually a mechanism that they can use where they are not even using that much energy in terms of we're not telling you to go protest for riots, block the streets. Like there are methods that you can start off with with avenues that exist before you have to feel like you have to get to that level. 
a lot of youth feel that it has to start there where it's very combative and, and that's something that we we don't even um, teach so I think that's the meaningful aspect of it because at the end of the day it's those young people in those communities who have to follow it through and so it comes back to their ownership so you can't come in and tell them what issue to follow they're the ones who have to want to follow it they're the ones who have to want to be proactive about it and initiate the kind of changes that they want to see in their communities because you're going to leave them there and and we see a lot of uh, larger organizations and things you know pouring a lot of funding and then they disappear so something doesn't even last long you, you put a borehole you're finding like for me personally we've had an issue where someone has come donated put a borehole drag a hole and stuff and then the local mca lost his election he went and he blocked that borehole and you don't know so you're wondering when people are complaining about water and you go and check you take pictures of it you take it to the water board and in kakamega because busi and kakamega share one and they're shocked they're like this is a very simple thing we just need to remove the the something they removed and there's water again so sometimes some of the issues can be solved by the community and there's lack of that information and it was really sad to now find out that now the current mca was actually thinking of wasting resources to build another borehole yet the problem was not the borehole you understand mm -hmm. so i think those are some of the things where youth are actually in these spaces and if no one asks or investigates we end up trying to put solutions which are more expensive but we've actually not really done anything we've wasted a lot of time mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And just to add on to what Nerima is saying, Stacey Otieno says, I think while the world needs more responders than reactors. <laughs> Natalia, I see you're smiling. <laughs> How, what role can the United Nations play, and especially in terms of being responders rather than reactors? Um, I'm just going to really go back to what Nerima said. Um, what you cannot do is be back in your home country and have the good intention of wanting to make an impact yet still hold the wallet i understand that money disappears and things go walking but you can actually create very smart mechanisms if you really want to help the local community give the money to the community and allow them to make their decisions do not make decisions do not spend the money that you have in their pocket for this community give it to this community and give the responsibilities. Of course, wherever money goes, things will always uh, uh, will go wrong. This is human nature. It's not about Africa. It's wherever we go in the world. So it's about if you really want to help Kenya or specific areas of the African communities, go and ask to the elders. Go and ask the local people and give the money to them. Not make decisions on their behalf allow them to make the right mechanisms and the one thing i think is that there is um you see when when you have a there is no such thing for me for non-profit natalia we can't hear you there is no such thing even though they may not be my making money these so i think we need to stop thinking that ngo is a non generating it can you hear me now i think my internet may be good yes. i just wanted to say we have we have the most amazing individuals and we can see them here narimo elizabeth tabitha each one of them so different and so passionate and so knowledgeable why should they not be put in a committee where they can decide where that money goes it's not you can protect money but allow the local communities and each individual to be able elizabeth to be able to make a decision of where should some of the money be spent and let the youth speak let the community make a decision for where their money goes spent mm -hmm. let the community decide <laughs> tavita um, I think I'll just add on like to what everyone has said because everyone has like raised um, points that I had also thought about, and to just finish by saying empower the people. Don't just give. Like Natalia said, 
yes, you have the money, but the people are the ones who know what needs to be solved and how it needs to be solved. So instead of always keeping them in a position where they always have to come back to you, empower them so that they grow. Because also, as we don't want to be 50 years, we are just relying on aid as a country and as a people. Like, so if we, if international bodies and the UN can empower the people, then that would make the difference. In terms of meaningful youth engagement, don't just have the, di don't just like listen to what they're saying and then don't act on it. Listen, respond, like take it into consideration, act on it, and then that's when we'll be able to go somewhere. Yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah, thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you so much, Neri Mawako, Natalia Polishchuk, Tabitha Nakoli, and Elizabeth Watuti. We have just concluded the UN 75 Dialogues in collaboration with the Sub-Saharan Model United Nations. And we are looking at the next 25 years of the world when the United Nations turns 100 years old. Oh my goodness, I think I'm going to be 50 by then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were asking ourselves, is the world going to be better, the same, or worse? If you're watching us from Facebook, what do you think? We have talked about the changes that we would like to see and what is coming out among all the panelists is meaningful youth engagement, enabling the community to decide for themselves and ensuring the education system also places young people at the center of decision making. We've also talked about hindrances like our challenges of registering your own NGO, not knowing where to start, you know, poverty, so many issues that we are facing that might make it very difficult for us to have a better world by the year, by the time that the United Nations stands 100 years old. We've also looked at the role of international organizations and especially the United Nations. And it's really putting people at the center of decision making, ensuring that young people who are in leadership positions actually know what they're doing. And it's also not assuming that people know everything that you're talking about. It's starting from the basics. So it's really important for us to look at all those issues. And lastly, we are also calling upon young people to take up the mantle and be the leaders of today. I've just said I will be 50 years old by the time the UN turns 50. So I'm no longer going to be young. So it means that I must ensure that the people who look up to me and people who are younger than me will be able to make decisions at that particular time. It's important for you to go out into your community. I'll just conclude by something one of my mentors told me, and it was at a time when I had just begun to discover the challenges that young people in the community were going through. And when I was telling her to go and help the young people in my community, she told me, when I interviewed the late Professor Wangari Matai, she told me, don't ask me what I will do for my country. Ask yourself. And I trust that these words came from the uh, late president of the US, JF Kennedy. And so I will challenge you as a viewer on Facebook and right here on Zoom to start something in your community. Be proactive, be a responder and not a reactor. Thank you so much, the Sub-Saharan Model United Nations, the United Nations for giving us this platform and to all the speakers for sparing almost two to three hours of your time and to the participants as well. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. We will continue the conversation online. Make sure you tag us online, hashtag UN75, hashtag UNGA75. I'll now yield the floor to Daniela. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I'm so happy. You know, we took time. A friend of mine was like, hey, you're having a ladies only panel. At you finish in two hours. I'm like, watch us. Two hours. We're done. You know, so thank you so much for keeping time. I will not make this long. Um, as I said yesterday, when we had the practice session, being able to set this up, many times, I don't know, part of me thought this should have been a lot more difficult than it was. But everyone on this panel was so willing and so ready to, you know, jump in and contribute. And I've just been writing notes. I feel like I've been fast. It's been a while. So I've just, I've just had so many notes for the report later. And there's so many learning points each of you have contributed. And I could not be happier. I'm so happy this is recorded so people can watch this over and over again and take notes. I told this to the other panel as well, like all of you are consultants and it's really unfortunate we can't pay you for the wisdom you just poured in here. But if you'd like, you can send me an invoice. Please uh, you know, be kind, but yeah, just send them in. We'll pay you for your consultation because um, what you've given is you know, really clear, straight to the point, and 
if you really think about it, it's very doable. This is advice the Secretary General and the team can easily take in. And I'm really, really grateful for your input, for your honesty. It was such a great conversation. Like I can't wait to see, you know, what other people have to say about it online. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for agreeing to moderate that, you know, so last minute. Um, uh, so Natalia was talking about inclusivity. So I'm very sorry, but this was intentional. They were trying to be diverse. We, we, I think we ticked every other box except gender, but maybe next time <laughs> we'll definitely consider it. But I think it was a really good idea to, you know, have such a space. The UN 75 dialogue is not only for UN bodies or just for big NGOs. This is a conversation, you don't even have to do it just on Zoom. You can do have this conversation within your different spaces, within your different organizations. You can register the event online. There's a form and everything. I can give you the guidelines if you'd like. But if you're able to host such a space, I would really encourage you to host such a space because you get a lot of wisdom. Um, every time I'm asked a question about um, in 25 years, it will be better, worse, you know, or the same. And then I think of such a panel, like, of course, it will be better. Even though it will be 50 and looking really good. I mean, look at this at this level. At least I know Cynthia, Elizabeth, myself, and Tabitha are pretty young. At least that's what I was told yesterday. We're not old, apparently. But yeah, we're pretty young and already, and we're not the only ones who are doing so many great things. So there are many young people really trying, and it's very um, encouraging. But it also means um, something, at least with Simon, we're really trying to do is working together. Because as much as it's great having all these different organizations, how can we still work together? So it's not a competition. You know, I can do something that could support someone else and really trying to, you know, build this community that is ours. I always say the SDGs will affect our generation more than anyone. If we implement it, if we don't implement it, the ones who will suffer the most are probably us. So if you're not doing something about it, what, what are you expecting? How is this, you know, exactly supposed to work? So yeah, once again, I would just like to say a very big thank you. I'm seeing so many comments come in, but I really don't want to take too much time. But please, please comment. Um, this is live on Facebook. Please comment on Twitter. Let's have this conversation, you know, moving around. I'll share the link, um, you know, with yourselves on email and on our page, it will be there as soon as possible. So I'd really like to end it there because I don't take too much time because, you know, it's our morning. I always me, I'm not a morning person, so <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. So this is a really big sacrifice. And I think, like, thank you so, so much. I really look forward to, you know, having such a space again and interacting with each of you. So thank you so much. And I'd like to end it there and wish you all a fantastic day and a fantastic weekend. Thank you so, so much. Enjoy your day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you for having us. Bye. 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 Uh, of course, I, no could problem. I get everybody's, can you please, I want to connect with all of these wonderful ladies. Can you please share my number with all of them? Please send me a message, guys. No problem. I send to you. I'll definitely do that. <laughs> please, I, everybody, Perfect. I will reach out to you. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Enjoy your day, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.